So which one did you? So that is, is open yeah, or secured by just the I didn't get out of the house. I was going to go to the house. But I, I ran. Your phone didn't work. I don't know my truck right now. I don't know why. It was so I ran. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, welcome all of you here today. Uh, we have with us a special, very special guest whose daughter is a student here at Snow College. Casey's father is an entrepreneur. So you didn't know you were going to be put on the spot for sitting on the front row, did you? <laughs> Our guest speaker is Mr. Ken Clegg of Private Lands Consulting. I'll introduce him after one brief announcement, and that is that if you completed the Opportunity Quest extra credit items, you need to go into the calendar to the Opportunity Quest item. I think its deadline is next Tuesday, um, or into modules and click on that and report that you did it. You don't immediately get credit, but we go through and verify your, your information with the information that was submitted to the uh, competition. So if you entered the competition, go in there and give yourself credit for that. I'll send an email to remind you and to kind of clarify how to do that as well. Uh, as well as a message with details for next week's class. We do have class next week, and it'll be our final class uh, period, I believe. So with that, I also want to introduce to my left here, I've got Josh Clegg, and he is going to help run some of the technology for their presentation today. And without any further ado, I'll introduce Mr. Uh, Ken Clegg of Private Lands Consulting, a firm he started in 1992. Four years later, he founded the CM. W CWMU Association. CWMU stands for Cooperative Wildlife Management Unit. And that program has opened uh, more than 2 million acres of private land to the public in Utah alone and provides an abundance of benefits to the state's economy. His company services a clientele base of about 80 properties with wildlife programs, as he will explain in his presentation today. When he founded his company, there was no private biological industry associated with commercial hunting enterprises. I don't even know if there is today. But that's one of the challenges that he faced. In other words, his company is kind of a pioneer in his field. If you're wondering what his field is, that's why he brought his technology with him to really explain it to you. So hopefully we can make that work. Ken has a master's degree in wildlife management from Utah State University. He also oversees dozens of not-for-profit hunting opportunities. He, his wife Heather, and their four children reside in Springville, Utah, and they're often involved in activities with their church. Um, they love the outdoors, and they enjoy hunting and rodeo. Will you please welcome Mr. Ken Clegg. Thank you. Let's see if that, does that seem loud enough to everybody? We good? Good. Excellent. Um, I got the greatest job in the world. Um, being an entrepreneur is something that I always wanted to do. I'll probably put you to sleep, because even though you do something that's really cool, if you do it day after day, 40 hours a week, for 25 years, all of a sudden it gets boring, anything that you do. I can remember in grade school, I, I was thinking, what do I want to do for a living? And my biggest fear was that I'd be screwing on toothpaste caps one at a time, you know, down an assembly line, and you'd just be doing the exact same thing time and time again. And I distinctly remember that I would do anything to get out of that type of repetition. I just, my mentality was, I can't do that. And yet, I've turned it into where counting deer and elk is like screwing on toothpaste caps to me. It, it's, again, doing that same thing once again. And so I promise you that whatever you decide to do for your career gets repetitive. There's just no getting out of that. Um, so as long as you're at peace with that, then, then entrepreneurship is a great, great way to go. Um, my dad was an entrepreneur. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a, a miniature golf course. We used to have a water slide. It was called Trafalga up in the Orem area. Um, my dad built that from stem to stern. And I remember picking up all the rocks that he was going to be putting in as obstacles on the miniature golf course and, 
and uh, so I've, I come from a long line of entrepreneurs or those that, that have, I just like being in business myself. I like, I, it, it would be hard for me to get a job and go to work for somebody where you'd have a normal boss or a normal schedule or you're punching a time clock. That'd be really difficult for me at this stage in my career. I'm grateful I don't have to do it. Um, I work a lot with uh, some of the properties that are owned by the LDS Church. So like the Deseret Ranch up in northern Utah. They've got properties all throughout the Intermountain West. And as part of that, there was one time where uh, one of the, the members of the first presidency now, as President Oaks, um, approached that, that management company and, and had a, a hunting opportunity. Believe it or not, he likes to, to hunt deer, and he wanted to do that. And so as part of what I was doing, I was supposed to take him out and, and I was telling him a little bit about what I did, do as an entrepreneur and, and he, he clued into it and he says, I, you're an entrepreneur, you, that's what you do. And he, he said something that really stunned me just a little bit. He said, I don't have an entrepreneurial bone in my body, but I sure respect those that do. You know, he was very kind and so forth. But I, I thought everybody did. <laughs> I, I just thought that everybody wanted to do things on their own and yet I think that there's a large part of society that, that doesn't. They, they don't really want to have to think up and, and wear all of the hats that it takes to be an entrepreneur. They just want to go swipe their card, put in their time, receive their paycheck, and, and be off and running. And so that's a very different thing and something that you guys will be jumping through the hoops trying to figure out if that's what you want to do in life. Um, my, I want to do a shout out for my wife. Uh, so she got a degree in chemistry, and in, as soon as she got her degree, we both were going to Utah State, she immediately went to work at Thiokol. So she was a rocket scientist, much smarter than me. Um, evidently biology isn't rocket science. And, uh, so she um, really went to work early in our career, and um, it allowed us to get our legs underneath us and establish a clientele base, uh, which without, I never would have been able to do. I'd have had to jump ship and go get work somewhere. Um, it was really difficult in the early years to gain a big enough clientele base that it was worth, where you had consistent revenue and consistent income at all the times. And so that was, that was a difficult uh, transition, and I'm grateful to my wife that was able to, to work through that. She only worked maybe six or seven years and then kids started coming and, and we were able to have her stay in the home and everything has worked out. But without that little jump start, it would have been really difficult. Um, so I have a simple business idea is really what the, the crux of private lands consulting is. And I'll see if I can explain it in a, in a simple term. Um, it turns out that the hunting opportunities on private ground have financial value. Okay, so if you thought of a place, an island, you know, Antelope Island or somewhere, if you, if you have one opportunity to hunt on that, on that island, it would have quite a bit of value. There'd be, there'd be a lot because you're the only guy that gets to hunt this whole island, and so it has, it, it, that increases the value. But the truth of it is, is that if you had two of those opportunities, it probably has additional value, right? And then if you had three, maybe a little bit more, and you'd keep going up and up and up until if you had 500 opportunities to hunt, really this 501st person or, you know, the, it would start to have no value. It would be the same as hunting on public ground or there'd be no resource left because you would have extirpated all the animals from whatever the resource was. And so the simple business idea that I had was that since zero hunting re results in zero revenue, and infinite hunting results in zero revenue, that means that somewhere in the middle of that, there's an optimum, that there's an economic optimum. And so that became my goal as, a, as an entrepreneur was to determine what that was. And, and it's difficult. It, it requires much, much effort and much work, but that's the simple business idea that, that got me started. Um, now, I want to point out, too, that that's not necessarily the same business model that, like, the state agencies would have. A state agency, they're, they're selling opportunities to hunt to the general public. And so what they're trying to do is to maximize opportunity. And that's a very different outcome. You, you would sell lots of opportunities. It might be more like 
the other end of that where there isn't value, you're just trying to produce a significant amount of opportunity for the masses, for everybody that you possibly can. But as I mentioned with my first idea, that results in no money to the landowner and, and to the people that own that private ground. And so it became apparent that I had to, I had to get new information. I couldn't rely on the information that's collected by the state agencies and have that make the landowner any more money. Um, so, so for me, it's a weird thing, but the, the biggest competitor that I have in my industry is to do nothing regarding wildlife management. So in other words, if I go up to a new property and it's got 5,000, 10,000 acres, and I say, I can make you some money, they're saying, well, I don't need your services. The Division of Wildlife will tell me how many deer I've got, and I, I'm good. I don't, I don't need to pay you anything. And so that's my competition, to do nothing. You'd think you could help out, you know, do something where a little bit would help. But that's been a, a difficult thing throughout, and yet we've got some creative ways that we've, we've gone about that. Um, also, incentives are gigantic with, with entrepreneurship. If you think that whatever it is that you're doing, if you're, if you're goring somebody else's ox, or if you're taking something from somebody else, um, that's not, you're going to have enemies quickly, and you're going to quickly lose the ability to make revenue. So I decided early on that I wasn't going to be an outfitter or a booking agent. So those guys, and there's a lot of them, there's outfitters throughout our state, there's guys that go find people from out of state or from in state, they'll say, hey, you give us money and we'll take you hunting and, and we'll make, a, we'll, you know, you'll get a great, have a great experience and we'll make some money, we'll pass some of that on to the landowner and, and things start happening. If, if my profession is looked at as competing with those outfitters or with those booking agents, I'm going to lose a vast, almost all of my clients would quickly look at me as competition and therefore wouldn't want to hire me for my professional services. And so it clouds your judgment if you are trying to do too many things. And so I found that out early on and, and have been really true to that and it's been a, an important concept of that. Um, that just leads to trust and, and, and you start being uh, respected in the industry. So, um, talked about how it, how, how it was a birth of an industry or pioneering in this. In 1994 was the first time they actually called it something, H, something else. It was called the PHU or Posted Hunting Unit. And that sounded bad. P, the PU, I don't know, it was just a bad acronym. And so they, after a few years, they decided CWMU rolls off the tongue better. And I'm not sure it does any, but, but it's Cooperative Wildlife Management Units. And essentially what it is, is it's, it's a way that the Division of Wildlife, or the state agencies, partner with a private landowner looking for a win-win. So what was happening is all those private lands they just were putting no trespassing signs. No one could come in. There was no public benefit to having anybody go on their property. It was a liability to them to invite somebody in. And so they said, hmm, we see that this isn't going to go well for the public. So let's, let's see if we can approach those landowners. We'll give them something, which is their win, and we'll get something, and that's their win. And so that's the birth of it, and it started just with a few. And it's grown through, you know, in the past 20 plus years, uh, it's grown now to where last year um, there was about 500 opportunities for public hunters to go on to deeded ground where they could go on and, and hunt and have a really good time. And it didn't cost them. They didn't have to reach in their pocketbook and pay some big fee to the, to the landowner or to the state, either one. Um, and so it's been a really good experience from that standpoint. Now the carrot that the landowners got was last year there was about 1,500 deer hunting opportunities. There was about 800 elk hunting opportunities. You know, cumulatively thousands of opportunities that, that the landowners were able to sell to clients on the open market. That's huge because the open market allows them to charge a, a, a fee and all of a sudden there's a lot of money that was coming in. If you put the amounts of what those would cumulatively add up to, um, you know, 
conservatively at $3,000 a, a hunt opportunity for deer and maybe $7,500 for elk, all of a sudden there's $10 million that's coming in to the landowners, to the outfitters, and it's every year that comes in. There's $10 million this year, there's $10 million next year. There's, that, that starts to be a, an industry. You know, that's a, that's a big thing. In addition to that, there's also all of the multiplier effects of what about travel? You know, all of the gas, the, the lodging, the food, the accommodations, the, you know, there's, there starts to be probably $20 million that's coming into the state on an annual basis. And so, um, quietly, I'm kind of proud of being able to be associated from the very ground level of that big of an industry. There remains to this day, states that have no programs for any private landowners, where they're, they just haven't figured out how to make the incentives work. And so there's you know, tens of millions of dollars in other states that are never brought to the landowners. They're never brought, the hunters aren't able to go uh, get to those properties. And it's just a whole different thing. So I'm, I'm really appreciative to a, a the Division of Wildlife Resources for thinking that through and for the private landowners being able to make that type of a relationship. It really was the birth of an industry and it's, it's been cool. Um, so uh, I know that not everybody in here hunts. Um, it's probably 10% of the population that hunt. It might be a little higher here in, in rural Utah, but it's, it's not very high. There's probably 10% that are absolutely against hunting in any way. And then there's probably 80% of us that kind of are ambivalent towards it. You know, some of them be on the spectrum of we're, we're cool with it and others where it's like, well, yeah, but they use guns and we're not okay with that. And, you know, I mean, there's just a big old assortment. And so it's really weird to think that your industry is every time there's a school shooting, we, we duck and go, gosh, what's going to happen to us next? If they outlaw guns and you couldn't hunt and then this $20 million industry goes goes in the wastebasket. And so that's, that's something you, you don't really realize it, but you need public license. You, you need to have people that are okay with you doing what you're doing in order to make a living. And so that's a weird thing about mine, but it's very true. I had to get a little bit um, creative with my marketing process. So marketing is funny. You know, how do you go about making money jump into your pocket without without hurting people. And so way back early in it, I, I thought, well, gosh, there's some things where the whole industry benefits from having something simple like the ages of the animals that are harvested. But no one wanted to pay for it. And so I said, what if we were to find one of those 130 properties, that's about how many there are now, and so if we can just find one of those properties that would donate a hunt, so they are saying, we won't take the money from that hunt, but we'll let whoever comes hunting on that, we'll put that money into your association. It goes into their coffers, and then the idea is, is that that's earmarked. It goes directly to this, this process of, of aging the animals. And so that's what we did. The first one sold for like five grand, and all of a sudden there was $5,000 in the association's pocket, and they were able to turn around and, and pay to have those, those animals um, uh, aged. And so we started to gather data. That's just crucial to the thing. And so off we went. It went from there to where we started getting that money, selling more of those hunts, and now we're, we're doing it so that Casey and Josh are going up and they're counting on these properties. And, and collectively, we've, we've, <laughs> we've done a lot of counts and, co and collection of data. We've got this big old mountain of information that's, that's coming down. Um, Sorry if you start falling asleep when I start talking statistics, but it's the, I don't know, it's the, it's the guts behind the, the program. So um, all of you know what an average is. You know, and averages are really, really important. Well, you can have an average, but it completely doesn't help you in any way. I mean, I'll be, I hope this isn't too, uh, too out there, but if you have the average human, it, it probably has one, one testicle and one breast. That doesn't describe anybody. I mean, it, there's, no, there's nobody that has those characteristics. And so you have to be careful with the, what you are measuring to make sure that you get the right thing that you're, that you're looking at, okay? Um, 
there's uh, those of you that don't understand a whole lot about um, biology, there's just a simple thing, a bell-shaped curve. So any kind of a growth, if you're talking a, a Boone and Crockett, okay, so and then this goes over and it never does hit the, the line, you know, so you cut it off there and you say well, there's two and a half percent this direction and there's two and a half percent that direction. This describes a population. It's, it, biologically, there are hundreds of those. If you've ever seen the, the movie called Moneyball, that's what you're working on. You're figuring out what you can measure so that you can improve it. And so with regard to antler characteristics on, on wildlife, what we found was that if the rate at which you harvest greatly impacts the size, the quality of the animal, which thus impacts the, the dollar value associated with that. And so if you took, we've got more than 10,000 deer and more than 10,000 elk, that we've got in, in this, this model, and all of those are tied to um, how many were allowed to be hunted on that one specific little tiny property. And so the entire population would look like that, but you could have one where it's like, well, yeah, but this place, they, you know, if this is small, if this is antlers, and it's so small being this way and big being this way, you'd have one where they harvest like crazy and they, they have a little thing like that. You know, it's, it's way down on this end and then you'd have another one where it's like on this end and this end and until very few are ever harvested on this place and collectively all of that data creates this gigantic, gigantic thing. And that became the, the crux of a business decision or a business model, if you will. Okay, so we'll come back to that later. I just wanted you to kind of have that idea in your mind. Um, so, what do you have? What do you have to measure? How big of an effort is this so that you can start to get an idea of how to how to build this industry? And the first thing you'd need is how many deer or elk or moose or antelope or whatever it is. How many do you have? You've got to get that. Well, it turns out that that's hard. My dad told me, ah, oh, it's easy. Just count all their tracks and divide by four. <sighs> turns out that doesn't work. I'm just kidding. It, that would never work. So you, how do you do it? So you have to figure out some way to, to measure those. What we've done is we've uh, randomly sampled on those because it would be really expensive to count every deer on a, in the state of Utah on some portion of it. You, it. you could perhaps do it, but it would be full-time job for many people. It would just be all that you do. And so you have to figure out how can we sample and then make it statistically accurate. So we sample maybe 10 or 15 or maybe even 20 percent if they want to spend a few more dollars to where you can figure out how many are on this one property. Last year we visited about 50 properties to try and determine how many deer, how many elk there are on that place. Then we turned around. That takes a while by the way. So Collectively, within the data set, we've, we've done that like 3,000 times. Each of those 3,000 times takes you about four hours. You have to drive to some far off place, spend two hours there, and then drive back. And so it's, it's expensive. But at the end of the day, you got good data. You've got good information. It's sitting in there, and, and it's telling you what you need to know. In addition to that, between spring, you know, April, May, something like that, two things happen in a half of a year. One is that all of the females have their babies. And the second thing is, is that all of the, the antlered animals, all of the males, have grown that year's antlers. And so you can determine several things from that. You can determine what's the ratio of males to females. You can determine what was your production or your, you know, what was your calf crop or your fawn crop. And you can determine the age of the animals just by looking at those. If they have big antlers, they're older. If they have young, small antlers. So with looking at nearly 100,000 animals, which is just such a big number, you go out and count that many animals, you start seeing trends. So it turns out that where very few of them were harvested, you have really high buck to doe ratios or bull to cow ratios, and you've got age structure. Not only do you have the young ones, but you have the mediums, you have the olds, and it's, it, it really changes things when you look at all of that. And then you come back down here, 
it could be that this is managed much like public land is. You have low bull to cow or buck to doe ratios. You have no age structure. If it gets this big, it gets harvested. And, and so you start finding trends. You start being able to, to determine, wow. So we could take this and then you can give tools to the landowners, to the decision makers of, okay, currently you're doing this and it's making you this much money. Well, switch it around. What, what happens if we cut that in half or, or take twice as many? And you can start to find out where those optimums are. And that's, that's what we did. So let's see, what else? Oh, and then in addition, one other piece of information is that you've got to measure the ages, the antler characteristics, the weights, the 10,000 different things that you can sit there and measure and fiddle with on animals so that you can determine what's the difference. And it turns out that the average size of animals that are harvested under this type of a scenario are much bigger than the ones that are under this scenario. And so, but you have to have all three of those pieces of information and you can't, there's no way to, you gotta go get it. It's, you know, it's not like you can Google that and say, what's the right, it, it doesn't work. You, you have to go get the information from that one specific spot and you have to measure it. And so that's been expensive for me to try and do. But expense is also a good thing. Keep in mind that every time that it's expensive, that means that there's money coming into my account and I'm able to, to hire people to go and collect that, that information just a little bit more. And, uh, and so you start gaining, gaining things, it becomes an industry. It is lots of work and I wanna really point that out. Um, I think I'd like at this stage to go to a video. Um, yeah. So we'll see if this works. This is one of those 50 properties that we went and counted. This occurred over a two or a three day period of time. Josh had just gotten back from his mission and he just took a few pictures with his phone. Say again. No, we're good. You can go ahead and do it. You can tell those are fish pellets, so they enhance their fishery by, by feeding. They feed like 2,000 pounds of Purina fish chow into the rivers and the ponds that they're doing, and holy cow, the fish were so big, and there were so many, and <laughs> it, was, it was just crazy at how much better they made this place because they were willing to, to go out and do something a little bit different. One thing that I found is that there's great diversity in properties that are well managed so there's many different species and there's diversity within each species of age structure and diversity of male to female ratio it's it's just stunning to me at how much better a place looks if you if you treat it well if you manage it well and you manage by the numbers i could take you onto this place and you your jaw would drop you know you'd be amazed at how different it is there's a simple barbed wire fence that is between this and the National Forest. You go onto the National Forest and there's nothing there. You know, I mean, comparatively. And uh, so that was, it was really stunning to me to see what you can do in just, uh, with making a few decisions. Now admittedly, this is one of the Fortune 500 richest guys in the world or whatever. And, and so he wanted to make uh, a, a place. And so he, he spent, uh, like hundreds of millions of dollars, I think, on improving a fishery, on improving the hunting, on improving his property. I think his tagline was uh, that it's the Blue Valley Ranch, it's God's work in, pro in progress. I love that, just because what he's saying is that he feels like as a steward of the land, he can make a difference. And he was willing to throw some dollars at it, and he was willing to take some time, um, but it was, it doesn't have to be some daddy rich bucks that owns the property. It could also be a, a guy that's just trying to live from day to day. The point is, is that if you do something, if you spend time, effort, and money, and you're measuring the right things, you can improve the product.
there are times where there are benefits to specific pieces of work. I, one of the things that I tell people is that the shoemaker's kids don't always have to go without shoes. <laughs> what that means is that occasionally there's some little tidbit of, you know, we fight over who gets to go to this ranch <laughs> because they let, they let you go fishing, they let you, you know, they let you participate a little bit, and you're the only ones that are. They have no commercial hunting, pro, hunting industry in any way at this, and so it's a, it's a, it's a fist fight on who gets to go do their work in this place, and, uh, and that's fun. You know, every once in a while there's some things that are like that. So good. Um, maybe pull up the model at this point. So while he's pulling up that, so that was just to kind of give you an idea of some of the places that we might work that are, that are kind of cool. Um, as he's pulling that up, I want to also go the other direction and say it's not all rosy. Um, I, I often say we'll be driving up and there's some, sheesh, that's a big animal or that's a beautiful sunset and, and I'll, I'll look at my, whoever's with me there counting and I say, yeah, yeah, another postcard setting. Drive on. Let's go. We've got to get, we got to collect the information. And so even though you're surrounded by lots of really pretty things, I didn't ever take those pictures. Josh was just back from his mission and he did and I was oblivious to it. I had to have him make the video for me to, to help, help me realize that, oh yeah, that does make a difference. Okay, so now going back to our bell-shaped curve, um, what I wanted to do was just give you an idea of, of how you can use all of that information. It gets stuck in one spot, and then what can you do to make, to make it make a difference? And so if you, if you think of this in terms of if, if a line right here represents 25%, and a line right here represents 25%, that means there's 50% in the middle. So if you look at the top line of animals right there, that represents the top 25%. The bottom line represents the bottom 25%. And the one in the middle is the lion's share. That's kind of what you're producing. And so um, on this example, we've got uh, a hypothetical population up there of 1,000 animals. Uh, if you look in the upper left-hand corner right there, and then and this one is currently set at a 5% harvest rate. That means if you have 100 buck deer, you're able to, to harvest or have five of them hunted at any one time. And, and then what it does is it just hypothetically predicts not only how, what the quality of those animals, but here's a picture that represents what those are. And, and I found that that was a really cool thing. It means that with 1,000 animals, your, your buck to doe ratio is going to be about 70 down here in this side, 68. So that means that there's going to be 400 bucks and roughly 600 does in that population. That's pretty, pretty cool. You know, that's a, that's a great thing, and that's what would happen. Then you could harvest roughly 20 of those, and then that's what they would look like over time. So then what we did is we said, great, so that's here in the middle or somewhere. What if we go less, or what if we go more? then the landowner, without having to change what he's doing in management, he can start looking for, well, what ifs? What, what if we decided to do this, or what if we did that? And how's that going to impact our bottom line? So, so let's go up. Let's say the harvest rate goes to 10%. Okay, so here's what that would look like when you update that. It changes everything, and then all of a sudden, with luck, <laughs> there. So now there's still that same thousand, but now you're at 50 bucks for every 100 does. There's only 340 bucks in that population. Since you're harvesting more of them, there'll be less that are left. You're able to harvest 34 animals, and we didn't even look at the bottom line. What was, the bottom line is now 23,000. What was it before? Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So in other words, you've really tipped it over, and it's, it's costing you money to harvest, even though you're able to, to harvest more, it winds up costing you money. And so that becomes really illustrative and important to a client. They're able to look at that and go, oh, I see. Um, now, it could be that their particular place is just a little bit different, and so you can fine tune it. You can say, well, instead of a hypothetical population of 1,000, let's pull in one of those exact specific ranches. So we know this is a five-year average that we've got 314 or whatever. So that's what you're doing now? Yeah. So this, this is a, 
a simple one. So I'm, I'll first have him go to the thousand population and I'll say, go up at the very top of it, 316, yeah. So now all of those numbers change. It determines so it's just for that place. And then if you look over here to the right, you can see that, well, yeah, but they tend to have a little bit better on average animal. The luck of where they live, you know, what genetically, they're really superior. And so you can tweak that with that number, the 1.03666. You put it over here on the Boone and Crockett. It'll then make those just a little bit bigger, which is what's on the ground on their place. So even though you've got the, the gigantic great big data set, it might not accurately predict if there's differences in nature. So Josh is changing that one. He's changing the ratio. And then now that becomes the exact, this is what they harvest. And it's based on, you know, real numbers and real figures. That becomes exciting to me because um, then you can really get down to the, to the brass tacks of how can we, let's make you more money. You know, this place is for sale if you're not optimizing or maximizing the revenue in some way. And so this really gives the, the landowners the tools that they need. And so now let's take that and we'll go back to the picks and so now, and let's put it at 3% harvest rate because I think that's where it... So now even though that ranch on average has been harvesting nine deer and they've been making some pretty good revenue, what it's saying now is that they really should harvest about four and a half, you know, four or five deer a year is what should be harvested and that that would increase from $20,000 that they were making before you did those changes to maybe 30,000. And so you can, you can start um, making decisions that are not only based on economics, but, but how much ec ep economics? If I choose to continue to manage the way that I have, how much does that cost me every year? What, what's that doing to me? And so that becomes a really important part of entrepreneurship as I see it. Um, I'm gonna ask if there's any questions at that point. Is there anybody that has any questions or do you understand how those things are functioning and working? Good, no questions might be a good thing. No questions could be a good thing. So um, let's go to the other video. So, pardon me? Gotcha. Uh, so um, occasionally we're, we're asked by the Division of Wildlife to, to utilize the data set that we have and help them. Um, so I was asked to come and help with a migration study that's happening almost exclusively on private ground and they said, can you help us? Where should, we get? Where should we capture? What should we do? We're trying to manage the deer on the big picture item. It turns out that in northern Utah there's so much private land that we, we're asking for your help. And I thought that was cool. And so this little video is just about a migration initiative. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it or whatever, but we're, this next week we'll be up helping them capture uh, animals that will be living the large part of their life on private ground. Um, and and so this is that part of it. So just a short video. Perfect. So if you ever want to volunteer for something in the state, um, <laughs> like on the Parker Mountains, they'll go and they'll capture antelope, but instead of using helicopters, they'll use these big nets and they'll shove them in, and then they need volunteers to go tackle them. If you ever want to get the crud kicked out of you, go do one of those. It's just the most amazing thing. It's like a, a rototiller that they turn loose and you go in there and you'll come back black and blue. This is a different process. It's pretty clean. There could be injuries. Uh, I don't know that the, uh, 
the humane society could say that that no animals and especially that no humans were injured in the making of this video because there there are some there's you know it's it's uh, very real it's on hands and um, they had a helicopter that went down last year you know uh, injuries occurred I, I gratefully there wasn't any deaths on that one but each and every year there's <laughs> you know throughout the United States there are those that, that are injured um, as a result of trying to get this good information so they'll put these collars they're they're destined to put out about 70 of those and then they give you real time you know like every 10 or 15 minutes or whatever you set it to they'll tell you where that animal is and what that does is it tells you where they cross the road where they cross I-80 where do they cross I you know highway 150 and and then you can start putting in structures that will save those animals you can start knowing lots more just on the physical biology of how many of them are getting jumped on by a cougar you know what's what's your mortality rate from this source or from that source and so the division of wildlife is putting uh, a lot of dollars into this our little association through some of those same reciprocal hunts that we were selling donated like seventeen thousand dollars last year to to purchasing these collars and to doing this and so again win wins if we're interested in it, we're willing to reach for our pocketbook and pay something to the division because it's a joint thing. We want, we want to know. And so I always think that that's kind of cool. Um, let me do one last thing. Uh, so if you decide you're going to be an entrepreneur now, I have a really small business. I'm the only employee of Private Lands Consulting. I have some seasonal help and some seasonal labor. It's, it's rife with nepotism. Josh and Casey have have done quite a bit and then there's all kinds of things that we that we'll do to try and reduce our costs where you'll you'll do it in-house and do, do everything that you can but when the dust settles all of the duties that are associated with running a business fall squarely on my shoulders I'm the CEO I'm the COO I'm the the guy that's in charge of the retirement program for for that business I'm in charge of all of the acquisitions, any buying or selling that you do with any of the properties. I'm the IT guy, which I better get him. I can't. I, I got ran over by the information superhighway. I, I don't. I can't do that kind of stuff. And so I have to find somebody to help me with with many of these aspects. I'm the hiring and the firing guy, the HR guy. I've got to know something about accounting. I've got to know something about accounts receivable, the billing, um, the secretary work, every aspect of that falls on me. Uh, I'm the insurance guy. Can you imagine how many different insurances you have to have? Your liability insurance with everything that's going on, your home auto, you know, there's 16 different people that are asking for money to make sure that you're insured properly uh, on all of those different things. I'm the GIS guy, so you have to know something about the mapping, you have to know something about there's, there's so many hats that you wear. I'm not telling you that to intimidate you, but I'm saying you don't get out of that. You, you, if, you are in, if you're in it, no one looks at that and says, oh, I wonder what we can do to help Private Lands Consulting um, prosper and, and get better this year. No one's looking out for you. You are by yourself on every aspect of that, on everything, and there's a lot more of them. There's, there's a lot of duties. And as I see it, none of those give you, get you a paycheck. You're, you're not able to send a bill to someone for the, the accounting work that you do. You're not able to send a bill to somebody for, so that they take care of your retirement. It, it's all, it rests solidly upon you. And, and so um, just go in with both eyes open. If you have a really good business idea, just remember that oh, it comes, you pick up both ends of that stick. And I've been really tickled with it. I, I would, if I had do-overs and I was at Utah State, I would do the exact same thing. I, I wouldn't change exactly what I'm doing. I like uh, being in business myself. There's really, if it fails, if it succeeds, it's really based on me. And, and I like that. Um, with that, I'll open it up to any questions any of you might have, any interest or anything at all. Gosh, I did a perfect job of explaining, evidently. Ah, yeah. Do you work outside of Utah also, or is it all Utah? A little bit. So um, another thing that you get to pay for is miles on your pickup truck. If you saw my pickup truck, you would just laugh. I, I got it about two years ago. 
I didn't dare buy it new because I know what I do to pickup trucks. And so it had like 13,000 miles on it. It now has 120,000 miles on it two years later. So I put about 50 or over 50,000 miles and so many of those are on dirt roads and running over an aspen and it comes up and whacks the side here and tears your mirror off and tears anything that's, it might, I take it to the mechanics and they just laugh. They, they look underneath and they go, it looks like somebody's taking a sledgehammer to the underside of your pickup. Yeah, they did. So it's, it's really rough on equipment. Um, because of that, I don't like to go very far. <laughs> so if you were able to see those CWMUs that are in the state, Springville's kind of right in the middle of, of a whole bunch of those. Ephraim's actually not too, too far away. You know, there's a lot of them down in the Salina area and in the Schofield area. This would be another place where you could set up shop and you're not very far from those places, but trying to minimize travel time and minimize wear and tear on vehicles and four-wheelers and GPSs and binoculars and spotting scopes, all of those are all something that you're looking, you're looking at to try and reduce costs. Good question. Cool. I'll be here after as well, and I'm happy to take any questions. I've got a handful of cards if there's anybody that has interest in this, and uh, just happy to, happy to chat with you more. like every week, the week to complete the work until next Tuesday night. See you here next Wednesday.